you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is, um, in the Old Testament, one of the books of Moses, um, the fifth book of the Old Testament, um, right after Numbers, um, right before Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is where we're going to be. And this passage that we're looking at this morning, it's a long passage, and I'm not going to read all of it, and we're only going to focus on maybe about eight or nine verses, but it's a it is Moses' final words to the people of Israel before um, God calls him away from them. And in this book, he's giving them some very clear instructions about how they're supposed to live and how they're supposed to love God. And in Deuteronomy 6, he really deals with motives and blessings that come when we live a life in obedience to Jesus. It's a phenomenal chapter. It is it is a great chapter. It's often used when we talk about families, of how we're supposed to raise our kids and how we're supposed to point them toward Jesus. And um, so it's often used in the context of that. But I want to use this passage in relation to our series of how we grow in our walk with Jesus. I want, how we've been in a series over the last several weeks just looking at what does it mean to grow? Are we growing? What does it look like in our growth um, That if we're growing or not growing? And so... I want to look at um, this morning the topic of how habits help us grow in our walk with Jesus. And so three things I want you to see from this text. First thing in verses 4 and 5, Moses speaks and he says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words I am giving you today are to be in your heart. The most important thing that God desires, the first thing I want you to notice is that God is calling us to know and to love him. The most important thing that God desires from you and I is that we would have a personal reality with God, that we would have a personal walk with God. I said earlier that this is a passage that's talked about raising children. If you are not following Jesus, you cannot pass that on to your children. You cannot pass on to your children what you do not possess. And this requires two things. Number one, it requires that for you to love God fervently, you must know him through his word. You need to know his word. The only way to know this God is by revelation to us of himself through the word. He is unchangeable in his attributes, and he's perfect in his ways. We don't learn about him through philosophy or mystical experiences or subjective feelings but we only learn about him through his word, which Moses emphasizes here in this passage. If you go through the text on on these verses, you'll see constant words like commandments and statutes and judgments. And in verse 6, it says these words, the words of God. We're not only to know Almighty God, but Moses says we're to love him. We're supposed to love God. Jesus identified loving God as the greatest and the foremost important commandment in Scripture. It's not enough to just know God through his word. It's not enough just to have an intellectual knowledge about God, even though that's foundational. You can't love a God that you don't know, but you must love him with all of your being. To love him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, means that it is an all-compassing love. It means entering into a personal relationship with God through saving faith in Jesus. But like any relationship that is going well, You've got to maintain it. You've got to deepen it by spending time with God, by reading and studying Scripture, by praying and listening to God. And Scripture says that this should be our number one priority, to personally know God and love God is a foundation for our lives. But to love God, you must walk with him with the reality on, a, on your heart level. Moses says in verse 5, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, with, and with all your might. These words I'm commanding you shall be on your heart. The idea there of heart, soul, and mind is a total person love of God. Every area of our lives must be consumed with and subjected to this quest of loving God. A personal love, a relationship with God is essential. Jesus condemned the Pharisees because they knew Scripture. They knew all the right things to say and all the right things to do. They honored God with their lips and with their words, 
But Jesus says, your hearts are far from me. Your hearts weren't near to me. They kept religious rituals. They did all the things they were supposed to do, but they lacked a love relationship with God. And friends, if we're not careful, it's easy to fall through the motions of Christianity outwardly, and yet all the while we're not loving God, and God is not ruling our hearts and ruling our lives. And loving God is not just warm, fuzzy feelings. Okay? Um, even though we need to feel love for him, genuine love for God results in a life that's changed. Results in obedience to Jesus. Jesus says these words, says, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. Genuine Christianity, genuinely following Jesus, is growing to know God more through his word and obeying him more and more, beginning on the heart or thought level and motivated by his great love for us. Listen, if we say we know and we love God, but we don't obey his commandments, if our lives are not changed by it, we're either deceived or we're lying. And obedience must begin at the heart level by judging our own sinful thoughts since all sin begins in here. Jesus said, and it's out of our hearts that comes all sorts of jealousy and anger and murder. It begins with examining ourselves. I said this earlier, this passage in Deuteronomy applies, is often applied to children. But think about it. Your religion won't work if you say one thing and you live another way, right? Your children will see the hypocrisy in your life if you are consistently angry and yelling at them and then all of a sudden you come up on Sunday morning and now you're super religious and you're lifting your hands in worship. They will smell that hypocrisy and you shouldn't be shocked if they don't follow Jesus. But if you don't show the fruits of your spirit through your, uh, to your family, if you don't show love to your wife, but then all of a sudden you lay down a bunch of legalistic rules on them so that they would look like good Christians to the rest of the church or the rest of the world, you shouldn't be shocked if your kids eventually rebel against you and against God. Now listen, I'm not saying that you have to be perfect, but I am saying that when you lose your temper or you don't display the fruits of the Spirit in your life to your family, you need to confess your sin to them and you need to ask forgiveness of them. That shows them what a genuine walk with God looks like. And this doesn't just apply to kids, even those who you're discipling and those who you're pointing toward Jesus. They'll know how you live your life. They're watching you. If you say one thing and you do another, they'll, they'll smell out the hypocrisy there. But if you want to teach your children to follow Jesus, You've got to love God fervently. His word must be on your heart. You've got to fight lukewarmness of just going through the motions like a plague. You've got to pray consistently that you would never lose your first love for Jesus. And if your kids and your friends and your coworkers see you walking in the reality of God daily, loving his word, applying it to your life, affecting how you behave and what you say and how you respond, growing in the fruits of the spirit, your love for God will be infectious to them. And that's the foundation for you to grow in your walk with Jesus. But there's a second thing I want you to notice in this passage. You and I, we're constantly in danger of forgetting God. Look at verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give you, a land with large and beautiful cities that you did not build, houses full of every good thing that you did not fill them with, cisterns that you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you eat and you are satisfied, in verse 12, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I don't know about you, but it's often in the good seasons of my life that I tend to forget God, that I think that I'm okay, that I've got everything going and everything rolling, that God's just there on like an emergency, like my speed dial number nine if I need 
an emergency, I can call God and he's there to answer me, right? Um, but I've got life going and flowing. And in this verse, Moses is talking to the Israelites about the danger of forgetting, especially when things are going well. Here's God's people standing on the edge of the promised land, ready to enter a land that has cities that they did not build, houses full of good things that they did not fill, and vast and lush vineyards that they did not plant. All of this stuff is just being given to them. And as good as the prospect of prosperity was, God says there's this danger that when you experience all of these blessings, you're going to forget me. When you experience all these good things going on in your life, you're going to forget me. And there's this danger that was lurking behind the blessing. Moses knew that in good times it was easy to forget God. And the people were in danger of forgetting that it was God that gave them this. That it was God that brought them to a land that was flowing with milk and honey. It was God that helped them conquer their enemies. And they would think that because everything was going well, it was because of their work and their doing. And they would all of a sudden forget God. In fact, it was only God's gracious choice of them as a people that they were enjoying the blessings of their new home and their new country. And if we're not careful, that's us as well. We will become unthankful. We'll become proud. We'll become self-sufficient. The kind of things that are offensive to the giver of every good and perfect gift. Knowing that this danger lurks in each of our lives, Moses gives us a simple and yet hard-to-do solution. There's the third thing I want you to notice in this passage. In verses 7 through verse 9, he says this. He said, you shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And you, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And here's the third thing I want you to notice. We need to develop habits that help you know and love so that you don't you need to develop habits so that will help you know and love so that you don't forget. And so the solution that Moses says for Israel, for them not to forget, and for that matter for us, for not to forget, is to keep God consistently in our mind. To find ways to keep God focused on us. To keep our minds focused on God. The book of Deuteronomy is actually a memory seminar. It's Mo Moses sitting there reminding the people of God's goodness to his people. He reminds them, the Israelites, of the law that was given at Mount Sinai. He tracks the Israelites all the way through the ways that God has miraculously provided for them in, in the wilderness. Battles that are won, food that was given, shoes that never wore out, clothes that never dis, um, got destroyed, the list of God's pro providential working. Moses is just listing to remind them of how faithful and good God was. And he invites them to do simple things, that if they do these things consistently and with attention, they will be able to keep their minds on God. We can say that these things are what we call habits. And it's only when we produce godly habits that we begin to see change in our lives. You don't become a mature believer overnight without installing some habits in your life. Tony Dungy, um, former Super Bowl coach, he once said that champions don't do extraordinary things. They do ordinary things, but they do them so well and so consistently that they do them without thinking, but they do them fast enough that other teams don't have time to respond. They follow the habits that they've learned, and that's what makes them champions. We've been talking about change. How do we grow? All of us want to change. But if you've been a believer long enough, you know it's a lot harder than just simply saying we want to change. We spend $10 billion a year on self-improvement in the U.S. alone. There's books, there's seminars, there's coaching programs that promise us real change. You can learn to be happier and smarter and sexier and more successful and more popular. We know what to do, or at least we can buy a book about it. And if we need extra help, there are experts that are willing to help us as long as we'll fork up the cash for them. But we still struggle to change. And we even find it hard to change when our lives are at stake, right? Um, 
if a well-informed, trusted authority figure comes to you and tells you that you have to make a difficult decision so that you can continue to live longer? I don't know about you, but me, I'm like, ah, he's lying. He just wants my money, right? Um, and it's still hard for me to change, even when life is at stake. That's grim news for those of us who want to change. And you would think it would be easier for those of us who follow Jesus. And in some ways it is. So I talked about this a couple weeks ago. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us in us that allows us to change from the inside out. And he gives us a new heart. And God is so committed to completing the job that he guarantees the work will get done. The end result will be impressive. And yet in the meantime, we look more like a bunch of fixer-uppers in the middle of a massive construction project. We're aware of our flaws, and we're tripped up by our tendencies. We can relate to the Apostle Paul when he says, the desire to do good is in me, but there's no ability to do it. For I do not do the good I want to do, but I practice the evil that I don't want to do. And yet Scripture says that growth is possible, and God promises that he will change us. And yet we're often frustrated because we're not changing as quickly as we often would like. Is it possible that we've been going at it the wrong way? We want to change, and we typically try one of the following things. We try new information. We want to change. We will read a book. We'll watch videos. We'll listen to sermons. We'll attend Bible studies. We think that new information will change us. And when this doesn't work, we'll go look for more information. We become more knowledgeable, but we often still never change. We become educated beyond the level of our obedience. Another thing we try is we set big goals. We set big goals to start or to stop behaviors. We want to read the Bible every year and then get stuck in Leviticus. We want to stop surfing social media, but we find ourselves scrolling through it again and again in moments of boredom, avoidance, or procrastination. Most of us set big goals to make big changes but we fail to see the transformation we desire. Seth Godwin is a business writer. He says, your audacious goals are fabulous. We're so proud of you for having them. But it's possible that the goals are designed to distract you from the thing that's really frightening you, the shift in daily habits that would mean a reinvention of how you see yourself. We set big goals. Another thing we do is think we can simply change by willpower. That all we need is just a little bit more willpower. But we find that that doesn't last, last as long as we'd like as well. And then willpower is depleted. Others argue that if we could learn to increase our willpower and boost it when it's weak, then we'll, be, we'll, we'll change. Either way, willpower can help us, but it cannot create consistent, sustainable change that we want in our lives. Looking back at my own life, I'm shocked at how often I rely on these things to change myself and or to even help others change. People will tell me, hey, I'm struggling. I'm just like, you just need to stop. You just need to force yourself to stop or change, right? And in particular, for me, I love new information. If you know me, I read a lot. I love to read. And so the temptation for me is, I don't know this. I'm going to grab another book and read and learn about it. And the tendency reflects on an incomplete and deficient view of my own humanity. I am more than a sum of my knowledge, my goals, and my willpower and if we keep trying these approaches, we'll keep failing in our efforts to change. So I want to invite you to, to try a new approach. Some of you, oh, that's my phone. Um, ESPN, something just happened. Um, um, some of you guys love theological sermons, and you love getting deep into theology. You're going to be frustrated today, because I'm going to be very, very practical. It's time to try a new approach. Surprisingly, change involves leveraging something we already use every single day of our lives, often without noticing it. You and I, we live by habit. We're not aware of it, but we do, all of us. The overwhelmed, the imperfect, the structured, the spontaneous, the rigid, the flexible, all of us are experts at keeping habits. The issue isn't whether habits are working for us or not. They already do. Scientists estimate that about 40% of our habits or 40% of our daily activities are performed in the, in the same way every single day. In other words, almost half of your day, you do without thinking about it. 
It's routine. It's habits that you do. And habits aren't just for disciplined people. We all operate by habits. We all look for behaviors that work, and then we begin to repeat those actions. Habits help free us from attention, from routine tasks, so we don't have to rethink the same thing over and over again. A habit, according to Oxford's dictionary, is a settled or regular tendency to participate, especially one that is hard to give up. A habit is a behavior that's automatic, it's comfortable, it's part of how we operate or how we think. Just think about, just think about the way you woke up this morning. I woke up on the same side of the bed that I wake up every single day. First thing I did, walk right to the bathroom, brush my teeth, took a shower. I didn't have to say I have to do this. It just was a habit. I made myself a cup of coffee. I made my, on a typical day, Monday through Friday, I make my kids breakfast, make sure that Micah, the youngest, his lunch is ready to grow, go, and then I uh, make sure he's ready. I will stand by the door at 6.55. As he goes, I quickly say pray for him. He gets on his bus, he goes, and then I go back to my room, I get ready. I'm not thinking about what's next, what's next. It just happens. I pull out of my garage, and whether um, I think about it or not, I automatically press the garage opener to close it. I'm not saying I need to do this. It just happens, right? There have been times, um, as soon as I get in the car, I usually turn on ESPN radio on Monday morning just to see how um, my sports teams did. The other days, I listen to a podcast, or um, I will listen to um, a passage from Scripture. I just do things without thinking. I just automatically press the button. Back a year ago, Micah was in daycare, and so there were some days Ann wasn't able to drop him off at daycare, so I would have to take him. And he would sit in my car, and I would totally forget that he was in my car. Right? My habit was jump in my car, go straight to work. And all of a sudden, I'm like a mile away, and he makes a noise, and I'm like, oh, crap forgot about him. And I've got to make a U-turn, go back and drop him. Why? Because I'm a creature of habit. I do things without thinking about it. I, and all of us are. Unfortunately, I also have a bunch of bad habits. I check my phone too often. I sometimes am too addicted to checking email or social media when I should be focused on someone else or something else. My wife back there could fill you with a list of pages of bad habits that I have. But that's, there's a reason why she's back there and I'm up here, right? Um, most of the time, I'm not even aware that I'm doing them. For better or worse, all of us live according to habit. We think we live our lives according to design or thought, when almost half of our lives are operate simply by habit. And to change, we need to learn how to create habits to help us become the person that God wants us to be. We need habits that puts us in the paths of God's grace to remind us of God's presence in our lives day in and day out. One of the most significant thinkers on the role of habits in the spiritual life is a man by the, names of, by the name of James K. Smith. He wrote this book called You Are What You Love. And in this book, he explains our first perception that we're thinking beings or brains on a stick. We expect that we can think our way to growth. And he argues that we're lovers more than we're thinkers. And in the end, we're driven by what we love and desire more than by what we think. How then do we shape our desires? Smith argues that we'll only change our desires by changing our habits. Good, godly habits become woven into our characters that we begin to do the right things. To become more like Jesus, is to internalize the law so that we will follow it more and less, more or less automatically. It becomes second nature to us, which implies that our first nature isn't meant, isn't doing what it's supposed to do. In other words, we don't change through thinking. We change by changing what we love. We change what we love through habits. Experience tells us that this is true. The people that you and I have met that are strong in their walk with Jesus are people that love God with all their hearts. And the reason that they love God with all their heart is because they have followed habits for years that have shaped their desires. As their second nature has become their first nature, and it puts them in paths of grace because of the habits that they follow in their lives. They can't imagine living life otherwise because they're just so used to living this way. Habits are formative. Rather than waking up every day deciding whether we will take in God's word or not, pray about our day or live in community, we can make those decisions once and incorporate those habits into our lives. 
This then makes behaviors automatic. This will keep us from wandering hearts that keep us on track of what it means to live a life that is full of God's grace. You and I, we need habitual obedience. Habits also help us shift to fo- shift the focus from the activity to the person of Jesus. When we first begin a new behavior, it takes a lot of mental energy. When we first learn to read the Bible or pray, we have to think about every step that we take. The focus at first isn't on God's word or isn't on the word or on God, it's on our methods. And when our obedience becomes habitual, we're able to direct our focus past the activities themselves to the ones that we're pursuing. The power of the spiritual discipline isn't the discipline itself. The disciplines exist to bring us to Jesus and put us in paths of his grace. Your habits is, in fact, one of the most important things about you. Those repeated actions that you take over and over, almost mindlessly, reveal your true self over time as much as anything else that you do. Our lives are shaped by what we do. And what we do regularly happens out of habits. The key to change, the key to change then is to change our habits. The good news is that once we build good habits, they're relatively easy to maintain. You don't have to decide what you do every day. You just do them. I never have to decide what side of the bed I'm going to sleep on. I decided that a long, long time ago, and I go right to that side without even giving it a thought. The bad news is that habits are hard to start. They're also hard to end. Ask anyone that's tried to quit smoking or ask anyone that's tried to wake up earlier to go to the gym like me. It never happens. Habits are powerful, and good habits have the power to change how we live. And because good habits are powerful, they can be hard to work with. You probably heard that it takes 21 days to form a habit. It's a lie. It's not true. Studies say that it actually takes about two months, almost 60 days, for a new behavior to automatically become automatic. We not only need to learn how to form new habits, we need to learn how to break bad habits as well. Friends, if we are going to grow in our walk with Jesus, if we're going to be who God has called us to be, we need to learn how to hack our habits. So let me give you some practical, practical things here. Number one, start small. Start small. Most of us try to put this big, audacious goal out there and say, we're going to do this. We try to make some sweeping change of our lives. And when when we don't see results right away, we stop the entire thing completely. It's better to change your environment to support the changes we like to make and then take baby steps. Make it easy so you don't fail. When you, make a, when you want to make a change, don't start with a big action. Start with one action that's so small that you can't fail. If you try it and you still don't succeed, shrink it even more. Choose something that takes such minimal effort that you don't need to rely on willpower to make it happen. Don't try to build multiple habits at the same time. Focus on just one thing. The goal at the beginning isn't even to change The goal at the beginning isn't even to create the change we want. It's to build a foundation for this. It's to build up the level of performance we want that the behavior becomes automatic. Shrink the challenge. Pick a behavior, shrink it, and then shrink it until you can, you're about 80% sure that you'll accomplish it, right? Don't start a goal by saying, I'm going to start reading 10 chapters a day when you don't even read one verse a day. Say, I'm going to spend, I'm going to read five five verses a day. I'm going to read 10 verses. I'm going to just pause for five minutes and read. Don't say I'm going to pray for 45 minutes when you can barely say good morning to Jesus in the morning. Say, hey, I'm just going to pause and say, God, thank you for waking me up. Give him glory. Make something small. Don't resolve to pray but longer than you can. Begin by praying for 30 seconds. Build from there. Grow slowly. Number two, shape the environment. Shape the environment that you're in. Your environment shapes behavior. A fridge full of veggies will shape your behavior. So will a cupboard full of chips and other unhealthy food, right? You choose what you put in there. Spend some time thinking about the environment so that you could 
create habits that you want to build. If you want to build a habit of reading the Bible in the morning, find a good Bible. Lay it right next to you so that you see it right away. To develop a habit of praying before looking at social media in the morning, plug your phone in far away from your bed. Don't put it near you. Shape your environment so that it supports the habits that you want to create. It's going to take work. Number three, use triggers. Use triggers to remind you to pray. Get sp specific. Pick the desired behavior. Make it easy. Simplify the behavior so it's easy to do. And trigger the behavior. Use a trigger to prompt the action. I'll tell you something later. And again, you can take it, leave it. It's just me. I've got alarms on my phone. At 9.38 every morning, my alarm buzzes right? And it just causes me to pause and to say, we learned this in Honduras, it just causes me to say, hey God, there are a bunch of people in this world that don't know you. Would you raise up people that will follow you? That prayer takes five seconds. It happens because of the trigger happening. Because if I'm going through my normal routine of the day, I'll totally forget to pray for you. I've got an app that I use called Echo, which is a prayer app. When you guys tell me a prayer request, I put it in there, and three or four times throughout the day, my phone beeps. It says, pray for this. Or pray for that. So it has categories. As soon as that beeps, I just pause 10 seconds. And sometimes, like this morning when I was getting ready to pray for family, literally my son, my middle son is sick today. So Jesus healed him, right? Um, Jesus um, told Micah not to be super hyper this morning because I don't have the energy for him, right? I mean, it's um, little things, uh, little triggers that happen so that I'm reminded that God's presence in my life, right? Um, I use this other app called Prayer Me, um, which lists a um, bunch of different ways to pray for different things, like how do you pray for your church? How do you pray for um, your own spiritual walk with Jesus? And so a couple times during the day, that pops up. It doesn't take a long time. Listen, I work full-time. I'm not one of those pastors that his life revolves completely around the church and expects your church life to revolve around the church. I know what a busy schedule is like. I know it's difficult to commit like five, six hours a day or a week to church activities. That's why we don't have a lot of church activities. But we want you to create habits so that you would grow in your walk with Jesus. Doing simple things daily makes you grow in your walk with Jesus. The desire isn't that you would do so much things. The desire is that you would constantly be reminded that God's there. And so these little things, these tools that are there, these triggers, will help you walk and grow in your walk with Jesus. Echo is a phenomenal app that helps me any time it buzzes, it's either something about family or someone at church or at work, and it causes me, causes me to pause for like 30 seconds and say, God, would you bless this family at church or this individual at church or whatever it is. It doesn't take long. It's just a daily habit. On my ride to church, uh, I'm on my ride to work, a couple days a week, I just turn on the Bible app and just listen to a psalm or listen to a proverb and just pause and pray while I'm driving. My house with three kids, it's loud, it's hectic, it's hard for me to sit quietly and pray. Finding spaces to get God involved into my life. Finding spaces where you say you're busy, we, we're all busy. But you're, there are times when you're driving or working where you can pause and just be reminded, hey, God's here. God's with me right now. And you know what happens? Is when you do that consistently, you're not waiting to encounter God on a Sunday morning you're aware that God is with you every single day. That you're in the middle of your work and when your phone buzzes and it says pray for your family, you're reminded that God is with you right there. And you're constantly aware of the presence of God in your life and it, your walk with Jesus begins to grow. Building habits takes time. Is there a set time to practice a new habit? Sometimes you say, hey, this is the best time for me to do this. Is there a set place for you to do this? Is there a reminder that you can use to do this? Are there other people that can encourage you to do this? Fourth thing I want you to notice, focus on making progress. One of the reasons we quit is because we notice the gap between where we are and where we want to be, and we have this image of perfection that we want, and we get frustrated, frustrated that we're nowhere close to that. Small habits done consistently, stacked together, create massive changes. Pick a small habit, so small that you can do it consistently. And when you got that small habit down, add another one. Stack a few of those small habits together, and you'll start seeing big changes in your life. Taking small steps consistently matter more than taking big steps occasionally. 
Look back at how far you've come and then celebrate your progress. Good thing, keep going even when you fail. Most of us tend to be all or nothing. This is going to happen or we'll quit. When we succeed, we keep going. When we fail, we stop. If we apply this approach to habits, we'll be doomed before we even start. Listen, you're not building habits in a lab environment. You're building habits in the middle of normal, complicated lives full of deadlines and dishes and difficult relationships and baby vomit and all sorts of other things that are going on. You're also not machines. We're inconsistent. We're imperfect. And even consistent people are inconsistent sometimes. When you're building a habit and you fail, just pick yourself up and keep going. Practice a clean state policy that the gospel is big enough to handle your failures, so keep going. Keep going. Number six, know yourselves. To succeed, you need a, for, to succeed for me, I need a structure to follow. Some of us need structured approaches. Others need to tackle habits with others, so they need external accountability or social support. But you need to figure out who you are. Some need an approach that's stimulating, that offers variety. We're all different, and that's great. That's wonderful. But we can leverage our differences to find an approach that works for us. The key is to think about what's worked for you and to do that. If you need a lot of stimulation or variety, experiment with approaches that, to habits that stimulate you. Gamify your habits, right? Reward yourself when you do them. Do them with others. Build variety into your plan. If you like to complete checkboxes and you say, here's a list of stuff I got done, then leverage that so that you do that. If you need external accountability or social structure, find others that could support you as you build habits and grow. Don't try to build them alone if that's you. Think about what works for you, what has worked for you in the past, and do more of that. Keep experimenting. Look for others that are like you and find out how they've learned to build habits in their lives. And the last thing here, pay attention to resistance. The six above practices usually work. And when we start small, when we shape the environment, when we tie habits to existing behavior, when we focus on progress rather than perfection, when we practice a clean state policy, habits become much easier. Most of the times, habits flounder because we're too ambitious, we don't set triggers, and we give up because we're not perfect. But sometimes, even when we engage in all these things, we still find ourselves stuck. And when this happens, go back and make the habit even more smaller and review other practices that you could do. And if you're still stuck, pay attention to resistance. Why? Resistance is the part of us that works against the change that we would like. And resistance often comes from ambivalence, competing values, or the fear of change. Resistance is often a clue that we need to make adjustments so that our habits will work better for us. And when we don't pay attention, we'll miss out on these adjustments and we end up in danger of sabotaging the habits that we're trying to create. Notice it. Name it. That's a big step in itself. Explore why you're resisting the change and gently uncover why you're resisting it. Revisit your motivation. Why do you want to build this habit? Clarify the why. Why do you want to do this? And if you feel ambivalent, dig deeper. Ask these two crazy questions. What's bad about this new habit? What's good about not doing this habit? Uncover competing priorities and value and try to work around them if you can. You may be resisting getting up too early to read the Bible, for instance, because you don't want to lose too much sleep. If that's you, look for another time of the day to read the Bible so that you don't lose your love for sleep. And then bring your fears to God. Fear can cause us from building new habits. I found it helpful to confess my fears to God, to identify what may be lurking underneath those fears. Our, feels, our fears reveal those things that we're trying to protect. Fears can be give, a God-given gift. We fear things that could cause our harms, like walking too close to a cliff. But fears can also reveal issues in our lives that need repentance. We fear embarrassing ourselves, for instance, because we get our identity from what other people think about us instead of what God thinks about us. Confess your fears to God and ask him for help in dealing with this. If you get stuck in building a new habit and you're practicing the first six things, it's usually a sign that you're encountering resistance. 
first six practices take a lot of work. But they're pretty simple. Overcoming our resistance can take a bit more work and may even involve uncovering some damaging behaviors in our lives. Start small. Use triggers. Focus on progress. Keep going even when you fail. Learn how to adjust your habits for yourself. Notice resistance. Explore it. Pray about it. Ask for help from others. Practicing these principles don't look like much, but the more you do them, the more they become a part of your life. Friends, I'm a big believer in habits because so much of our lives run on autopilot. It's impossible to change without changing our habits. Our habits form us into the people we are. I've never seen anyone change without this. Habits are a great way to build discipline in our lives, especially for those of us who aren't disciplined. Donald Whitney has written a lot about spiritual discipline. He said that I've never known a man or a woman who's come to spiritual maturity except through discipline, except through habits. Habits help us so that we're disciplined in doing the things that we need to do even when we don't feel like doing it, and even when we don't think of ourselves as disciplined people. And let me encourage you to close with this. Habits are essential, but in the end, habits aren't the point. Habits aren't the point. If we focus on habits and disciplines themselves, and if that's the only area where we focus on, you will become arrogant and judgmental of others who aren't as successful as you. And that's not what we're looking for. I remember growing up in the church that I grew up in, there was a guy that used to stand up at the end of every year and talk about how he read the entire Bible three times that year. And when our church split into three, he was the main cause behind it. Right? You can do a lot of really, really good things that sound godly, but if it doesn't change your life, it doesn't mean you change it. The goal isn't that you've done scripture reading. It doesn't impress me how many memory verses you know. It doesn't impress me if you can quote scripture backward and forward. It doesn't impress me if you've read the entire Bible. You know what impresses me is when you see you loving Jesus with all your heart and you love people with all your heart. That's what God desires. Habits are meant to make you more like Jesus. The truly transformative element is not the discipline itself, but the worthiness of the task that's undertaken, the value of prayer, the value of reading God's word, the value of being in community. The point in the end is we are pursuing Jesus. We need habits that support our pursuit. We will not pursue God without them. And these are ways of putting us in the path to God's grace. David Mathis compares the habits to flitch it, um, flipping light switches on. We don't produce electricity any more than we control the supply of God's grace. But there are ways of turning on that power in our lives. The habits that we form allow us access to God's grace so that his grace will flow through our lives. These are paths along which he has promised his favor. Friends, if we want to grow to be what Jesus has called us to be, and I invite you to build habits that will put you in the path of God's grace throughout your day, not just on what you do on Sunday morning. Start small. Pursue progress. Wipe the slate clean when you fail. Gradually add other habits until your life is increasingly shaped by things that make you a reflection of Jesus. And as you build the habits, remember, habits are essential, but they're not the point. They're a means to an end. And that end is God. Bad habits remind you it's God that you need, and that God is the only one that can change you, that he promises that he will help you. But can I invite you to build habits that remind you of your dependence on Jesus? Hebrews 11 says that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who are pursuing him. He rewards those who follow him. So let's build habits that support the activities that God promises to do us. Let's build in our lives things where we encounter Jesus on a daily basis 
so that our lives are transformed. And because our lives are transformed, our families are blessed, our church communities are blessed, our workplaces are blessed, the world is blessed. As we come to communion, we're reminded that these habits that we do, praying, reading scripture, community, only happen because of what Jesus did on the cross. We have access to the throne room of grace because Jesus, as he died, allows us now to come to the Father and pray as well. Because of Jesus, we have been made priests in the kingdom of God. We are part of the royal priesthood. We have access to hear God's voice for ourselves. Because of Jesus, he says, I will build the church and I will build you in community. And so as we come to communion this morning, I want to invite you to be reminded of Jesus. Jesus who loved us, who died for us, who cared for us, who called us a part of his family. And I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, your attitudes. I'm going to invite you this morning to just commit to Jesus. Ask Jesus, Jesus, I don't have any habits that are honoring you. Help me to start small so that I will bring much glory and honor to you. And would you just spend some time with Jesus and when you're ready, let's take communion together and worship our Savior.